Income tax 2023-2024. Rental property special situations. Condominiums, corporatives, and property changed to rental use. Get ready and some coffee because we're setting our refund to the max with income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in Publication 527, Residential Rental Property, including Rental of Vacation Homes Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. The rental property Schedule E, typically rolling into line one income of the income tax formula. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement, having income minus, instead of expenses, deductions resulting in instead of net income taxable income the rental income from the schedule e similar to the business income reported on a schedule c is basically an income statement in and of itself having rental income minus rental expenses which are basically rental deductions resulting in in essence net rental income which is what rolls in from the Schedule C to Line 1 income of the formula. The formula here outlining the calculation on the Form 1040 of which we see the first page here, the income section, the Schedule E ultimately rolling into Line 8, additional income from Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income Part number one, additional income, the Schedule E rolling into line five, rental, real estate, royalty, so on and so forth from the Schedule E. This is the Schedule E where we have the supplemental income and loss from rental, real estate, royalties, and so on and so forth. We're, of course, looking at the real estate situation here, basically having an income statement format per property. All right, so we've talked about rental income in prior presentations, remembering that the rental income is similar to the Schedule C, that it has that income statement format, but it has that kind of passive nature to it. And that could be useful or beneficial in some cases because you might not be subject to the Social Security and Medicare in the form of self-employment tax as you would with a Schedule C, but also could be limited to losses because of the passive nature of the income. Now we're going to go into some more kind of the special situations for the condominiums and then the corporatives. And then we'll take a look at what if we used the rental property partially for business and partially for personal. First, the condominiums. So a condominium is most often a dwelling unit in a multiple unit building, but, not, but can also take other forms such as a townhouse or garden apartment. So our baseline scenario has been, we have a second home, for a residential property that we're not using as a home, but we are thinking of it as rental property. We are renting it out. And the simplest format would be that we're renting it full time. It's just rental property. We're not using it personally in any way. But of course it gets a little bit more complex when we have different types of dwellings, such as the condominium dwellings. So if you own a condominium, you also own a share of the common elements such as land, lobbies, elevators, and service areas. So in other words, if we were talking about the baseline case where we just have another house, another piece of property that we are renting, then of course it's all rental property. But in the condominium situation, we also have those common areas like the lobbies and the elevators and whatnot, which are part of the property, although not assigned to any particular unit of the property because that's the common area. So you and the other condominium owners may pay dues or assessments uh, to a special corpor corporation that is organized to take care of the common elements, which is a common situation. So now we're saying we have our own place but of course, the common area within it needs to be maintained. It's in everybody's interest to have it maintained. So we need some type of organization set up to take care of the common area oftentimes. So special rules apply if you rent your condominium to others. So we might have our condominium that we're basically renting in like a sub-renting uh, type of situation. 
So you can deduct as rental expenses all the expenses discussed in chapter one and two. In addition, you can deduct any dues or assessments paid for maintenance of the common elements. So we have that common elements added component, which we don't typically have when we're talking about just our own rental property that's not part of the condominium structure that has those elements within it. You can't deduct special assessments you pay to a condominium management corporation for improvements. So if it's an improvement situation, so it would make sense that if we're paying for the service of the common area and that's an expense to us, that that would be something possibly that would be deductible. But if it's an improvement situation, you want you run into the common problem, which is going to be, well, you think you might be able to get a benefit from it, but do I get to expense it or do I have to put it on the books as an asset that will be depreciated, for example? However, you may be able to- First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com to recover your share of the cost of any improvements by taking depreciation. All right, let's talk about corporatives, which is another kind of somewhat unusual structure. So we have our baseline case, separate rental property. It's just another unit. It's completely rental, rental property versus the situation or setup for a corporative. All right, so we're gonna go through this relatively quickly because I don't think this is as common a scenario, but it's a good example of how we can have some deviations and complications for different entity structures. The entity structures making sense for other reasons, but could lead to complications. And this I think is a good example of why when you make simple rules related to taxes and many other things that are government rules and regulations, that they can they can have consequences that you're not really aware of in the business world because it can really limit the way people might set up their organizations because when the rules were set up they set it up with a particular standard organizational structure in mind but that might not be the most optimal organizational structure depending on what your needs are anyways if you live in a cooperative uh, you don't own your apartment. Instead, a corporation owns the apartment and you are a tenant stockholder in the corporative housing corporation. So see how they've structured it here. We're basically saying, instead of owning the place, the unit uh, individually, we're gonna say the whole place is basically like a corporation and we're gonna have unit ownership in terms of basically shares, right? Similar to a corporate uh, type of situation, corporation. So if you rent your apartment to others, you can usually deduct as rental expense all the maintenance fees you pay to the corporate housing corporation. In addition to the maintenance fees paid to the corporate housing corporation, you can deduct your direct payments for repairs, upkeep, and other rental expenses, including interest paid on a loan used to buy your stock in the corporation. So you buy this stock in the cooperative, you have your unit, you rent it to somebody else. Similarly to renting a separate piece of property, you would think you would be able to deduct ordinary and necessary expenses related to the rental, including the repairs and maintenance and the fees for the common area to you for the cooperative. However, it gets a little bit more messy with regards to depreciation. So depreciation, you will be depreciating your stock in the cooperative rather than the apartment itself. So now instead of us buying a separate unit, a home, 
which has land and building, remembering that we need to break out between land and building because the building is depreciable, the land is not. We now don't really own the building itself, we own the stock, which is shares that are representing part of the ownership of the property. But that stock is supporting a building, right? So you would think we would be able to depreciate the stock, at least the price or part of the price that's allocated to the building, which is the thing that we are renting. Obviously, if we lived in the cooperative, it wouldn't really be a problem typically because we don't depreciate it as our principal residence. Although we do have to keep track of the basis so that when we sell it, we can calculate the proper gains and losses at that time, which if was our principal property might be excluded with the exemption. But when we rent it, now we got to put the depreciable part on the book so we can get that big benefit of allocating the cost in the form of depreciation. So figure your depreciation deduction as follows. Figure the depreciation for all the depreciable real property owned by the cooperative. So how do we have to figure this out? We look at the whole cooperative, the entire thing. We have to value, in essence, the corporation itself. And then depreciation methods are discussed in chapter two of this publication and publication 946. So we're not going to get into the specifics of depreciation. Our major point here is to think about what will be the basis or cost that we need to apply the depreciation methods to. So if you bought your corporate stock after its first offering, figure the depreciation basis of uh, this property as follows. So multiply your cost by the share, uh, share by the total number of outstanding shares, add to the amount figure in, uh, in a, any mortgage debt on the property on the date you bought the stock, and then subtract from the amount figured in B, any mortgage debt that isn't for the depreciable real property, such as part for the land. So we have to break out between the land and the building. Subtract from the amount figured in one any depreciation for space owned by the cooperative that can be rented but can't be lived in by tenant stockholders. Divide the number of your shares by stock uh, of stock by the total number of shares outstanding, including any shares held by the cooperative. Multiply the result of two by the percentage you figured in three. This is your depreciation in on the stock. I'm not going to go into that in detail again here because I think the cooperatives are not the most common uh, structure, but you can see what the general idea here and the problem that happened is. And that is, of course, now we don't have a cost or basis of the property itself because we're investing in the stocks. We don't have an easy way to break out between the land and the building as we might have in a separate property with property, possibly the property tax statements. So we want to take the value of all the stocks, right? And then try to figure out the percent value for our particular property, not including the, the, the property that's going to be uh, not livable, meaning the, the space in between the buildings and whatnot, and not including the amount that's going to be allocated to the land versus the building. So that's going to be you know, the general idea there, if you're in the cooperative, you want to kind of, and if you're thinking about purchasing in a cooperative, it might be a useful structure because that corporation structure usually makes things easier. That's the point. But when you rent it out, it becomes complex because of the depreciation rules and calculations. And so you want to make sure that you have an idea what you're going to do in, uh, in that situation. All right. Your depreciation deduction for the year can't be more than the part of your adjusted basis defined in chapter two and the stock of the corporation that is allocable to your rental property. Payments added to the capital account. So payment uh, earmarked for capital assets or improvements are otherwise charged to the corporation's capital account are added to the basis of your stock in the corporation. So when you're making payments that once again, breaking out between the repairs and maintenance versus the the value of the property we have to have some way to account for that so that we can see should it be something that should be expensed or should it basically be capitalized and depreciated so for example you can't deduct a payment used to pave a community parking lot instead uh, install a roof or pay the principal of the corporation's mortgage 
So treat as a capital cost the amount you were assessed for capital items. So now the corporation is going to say, we need, we need to improve the structure. Normally, when you pay the corporative, it's going to be expenses because they're going to be doing repairs, but they're not doing repairs now. They're doing capital improvements. So now you're not paying for the entire new roof, but you are paying to the corporative who is charging for an entire new walkway or something like that, which is not going to last just this year, but multiple years. Therefore, typically it should be an improvement and the payment that you're making for it is part of a capital improvement in that case then generally would be the idea you would think instead of just a normal repair and maintenance so this can't be more than the amount by which your payment to the corporative exceeds your share of the corporation's mortgage interest and real estate taxes so your share of interest and in taxes uh, is the amount the corporation elected to allocate to you if uh, if it reasonably reflects those expenses for your apartment so the other cost we have, of course, is the property taxes. Now, again, you're, you have, you've structured this in the form of a corporation. Therefore, the entire property is going to be valued, you would think, and assessed property taxes for state and local property taxes paid by the corporation. And then the corporation is somehow going to have to collect that from the, the people, the, the corporative owners, right? So you would think that they would allocate in some rational way the cost of property taxes amongst the owners. And if that was a, a fair allocation, then you would think that you can deduct it as long as it's reflective of the actual property taxes assigned to your property is the general idea, I believe. Otherwise, figure your share in the following matter. Divide the number of shares of stock by the total number of shares outstanding, including any shares held by the corporation. Multiply the corporation's deductible interest by the number you figured in one. This is your share of the interest. Multiply the corporation's deductible taxes by the number you figured in one. This is your share of the taxes. In other words, you would think if they didn't give you the allocation of the property taxes that you can deduct that you might be able to figure your percentage of the corporation reflecting your percentage ownership in essence in the property and multiply that times the property taxes property charged to rental use so if you change your home or other property or a part of it to rental use at any time other than the beginning of your tax year, you must divide yearly expenses such as taxes and insurance between rental use and personal use. So now we have a situation. Let's say we have a home. We have our, our principal residence that we live in and we're changing it to rental property. Either we're moving somewhere else, we're moving to an apartment maybe or a smaller place and then renting the property or we're taking part of the property in our home and renting it. Now we haven't rented it the entire year. We didn't convert it to rental property for the entire year. So now we have a situation where only part of the year is uh, rental property. So if we have costs to the property that are for the full year, such as like real estate uh, taxes, property taxes, then we would have to determine the amount of those costs that are for the part of the year that was personal and the amount that was for the part of the year that was the rental property. That's the general idea that you would think that you would have to break out. Now, if you are renting part of the home, rather than having the entire home either be rental or personal, then you're also going to have to think about the portion of the home that is rental versus personal. So you have two kind of things going on there. If the home was personal, I converted part of it to rental property during the year, then costs that are allocated to the entire year, such as possibly property taxes, need to be allocated between the personal part of the year and the rental part of the year. And they also need to be allocated because they're probably on the entire home between the personal use of the home versus the business use of the home. All right, so you can deduct as rental expenses only the part of the expenses that is for the part of the year the property used uh, was used or held for rental purposes. You can't deduct appreciation or insurance for the part of the year the property was held for personal use. However, you can include home mortgage interest and real estate taxes 
expenses for the part of the year the property was held for personal use when figuring the amount you can deduct on Schedule A. So as is the general rule, if it's your principal residence, then you might still get a deduction for things like the real estate taxes and the uh, interest you paid on the mortgage. It's just that it wouldn't be deducted on, say, the Schedule E as rental property, but rather on the Schedule A if you were able to itemize. So you have to have the proper breakout between like the Schedule A and the Schedule E for those items. But if you're talking about, say, depreciation, for example, you only get depreciation for the rental property, and therefore you would only be able to allocate the depreciation for the portion of the year which it was rental property, number one. And number two, if you had property that was partially rental and partially business, you would also have to allocate depreciation only to the part of the property that was for rental use. Example, so your tax year is the calendar year. So it's calendar year, normal year. You moved from your home in May and started renting it out on June 1st. So you can deduct as rental expenses seven twelfths of uh, your rental expenses, such as taxes and insurance. Now, obviously, remember, there might be some expenses, of course, that are not allocated to the entire year. So if you if you did maintenance or whatever on the home during the time of year that it was rental property and whatnot, then you don't have this problem of having to allocate it through the entire year. But some expenses are for the entire year, like the property taxes, the depreciation is sometimes calculated for a year, right? And so then you have to figure out how much would be for the part of the year. So starting with June, you can deduct as rental expenses the amounts you pay for items generally billed monthly, uh, such as utilities. When figuring depreciation, treat the property as placed in service on June 1st. Basis of property changed to rental use. So when you change property, you held for personal use to rental use, for example, uh, you rent your former home. So you lived in it, you moved out, and now you're, rent you're, now you're renting it. It was your principal residence, now you're renting it. The basis for depreciation will be the lesser of the fair market value or adjusted basis on the date of conversion. Now, remember, this is usually going to be a bit of a problem or something that you have to go back and do some research on for most people, because when it's your principal residence, you get a tax benefit from it, but you only get a tax benefit for generally like the mortgage interest and the property taxes. You don't get to depreciate the property. Therefore, you might not be tracking as well as it would be nice to do the adjusted basis of the property, which typically when you buy the property is like the cost of the property, but also includes things like improvements uh, to the property. That adjusted basis is going to be really important when either you sell the property, in which case you have to calculate the gain on the property and see if you have to pay taxes on it, which if it's your principal residence, even if you have a gain, you might not have to because of the exclusion for a principal residence or if you convert it to rental property, you're going to have to put it on the books as rental property. You don't know what the cost is uh, or you don't know what the current fair market value is because you haven't really sold it, right? You have to go back and figure out what the basis was, what you paid for it. And if the fair market value, notice it says here, the, the depreciation will be the lesser of the fair market value. So if the fair market value is less than what you paid for it, which hopefully isn't the case, typically, hopefully rental property goes up in value over time. Uh, but, uh, and therefore we would have to go figure out what our cost or basis was. And then how would I know if the fair market value is less than what I paid for it? Well, you could do some, you'd have to do an appraisal in some way. You can look at related property or you might actually have to get an appraisal given the fact that it's just an estimate because all real property, all real estate is valued based on the market, but you don't know what it is until you actually sell it. So any kind of assessment is just an estimate. Also just realize that if you inherited the property, then you have the question of what's the cost or basis, which could be at the point in time that you inherited it or is it at the point in time that the person that and that uh, gave it to you in an inheritance at his basis when they bought it right and and then which could be different 
from if they gifted it to you. If they gifted you the property at some point, then the question is, is the cost or basis the fair market value at the point of gift or possibly more likely there at the point in time that they bought it? And in terms of that question, you want to consider the impacts of those answers with regards to estate planning, for example. All right, fair market value, what is that? This is the price at which the property would change hands between a willing buyer and willing seller, neither, neither having to buy or sell, and both having reasonable knowledge of all the relevant facts. So sale of similar property on or about the same date may be helpful in figuring the fair market value. That's great in principle, it's market-based. It's saying, hey, look, this is the value of the property if you were to sell it at this point in time to a buyer that wasn't coerced there wasn't a gun to their head or anything like that. But again, you don't. it's still going to be an assumption because all property, when you're talking about real property, is unique. Unlike stocks, which are trading all the time, where the fair market value is much more easy to determine. So you might actually need to do some work, of course, to get an, appropri an appropriate appraisal to determine the fair market value. Figure in the basis. The basis for depreciation is the lesser of the fair market value of the property on the date you changed it to rental use or, and the basis is of course the cost or adjust, basically you think of it kind of like the cost that you're allocating over the useful life, possibly getting part of the depreciation related to the basis, at least the basis that is assigned to the building part, which you can depreciate versus the land, which you can't. So your adjusted basis on the date of the change, that is your original cost or other basis of the property plus the cost of permanent additions like improvements or improvements since you acquired it minus deductions for any casualty or theft losses claimed on earlier years and income tax returns and other decreases in basis. In other words, if you already got a tax benefit through like depreciation or some other form, then that would typically decrease the basis. For other increases and decreases to basis, see adjusted basis in chapter two. Example, so you originally built a house for 140,000. You built it, man, you're amazing. So on a lot that costs 14,000, it's a log cabin maybe, which you used as your home for many, I saw someone do it on YouTube and I was like, I could do that. Anyways, uh, before changing the property to rental use this uh, this year, you added 28,000 of permanent improvements to the house and claimed a 3,500 casualty loss deduction for damage to the house. So part of the improvements qualify for a 500 residential energy credit, which you claimed on a prior year tax return. Because land doesn't depreciate, you can only include the cost of the house when figuring the basis for depreciation. All right. So what's the basis in the adjusted basis of the house uh, at the time of the change in its use was 164,000. So there's the 140,000 plus the 28,000 because that was an improvement like a new roof or something you put on it minus the 3,500. That was a casualty loss. If the casualty loss was on the property, you already got a tax benefit for it and you would assume that the value of the property went down. That's why you got had a tax consequence for it. And so it decreases it. And then you've got the 500 for the residential energy credit that decreases it. So you have the potential energy, the potential deduction of the 164,000 that is still left in the property, which you, hopefully we can take either in the form of depreciation. And if it's not depreciated by the time we sell it or something, then of course we might get the benefit at the point in time that we sell it because we're gonna have in, income minus expenses or gains, the gains, right? The sales price minus the adjusted basis at that point. And any basis we have left at the point in time we sell it, will have a lower gain, which will be a tax benefit or a greater loss. On the date of change in use, your property had a fair market value of 168,000 of which 21,000 was for the land and 140,000, uh, 47,000 was for the house. So now we have to break up between those two. How do we do that? Maybe you can use your property taxes to see the ratio of house versus land on it and use the same ratio breakout to break this out. This will mean that the 147 of the house could give you depreciation. What does that mean? You're just never gonna get a benefit of the 21,000? 
No, it means that if you hold on to the house long enough, you might be able to depreciate it if it was all rental property. Then it'll still have a basis of $21,000, which you might get a benefit for at the point in time that you sell it because that's going to result in a lower gain at the point of sale. So the basis for depreciation on the house is the fair market value on the date of the change, $147,000, because it is less than your adjusted basis of 164,000. So we're taking the lesser of the fair market value and the and our adjusted basis. So the basis of the depreciation of the fair market uh, on the house is the fair market value uh, on the date because it was 147 because it is less than the 164 that we came out to up top. All right, corporatives. So if you change your corporative apartment to rental use, figure your allowable depreciation as explained earlier. Depreciation method are discussed in chapter two of this publication and publication 946. The basis of all the depreciable real property owned by the corporative housing corporation is the smaller of the following amounts. The fair market value of the property on the date you change your apartment to rental use. This is considered to be the same as the corporation's adjusted basis minus straight line depreciation unless this value is unrealistic. The corporation's adjusted basis in the property on that date don't subtract depreciation when figuring the corporation's adjusted basis. If you bought the stock after its first offering, the corporation's adjusted basis is the property is the amount figured in one under depreciation earlier. The fair market value of the property is considered to be the same as the corporation's adjusted basis figured in the way minus straight line depreciation unless the value is unrealistic. Figuring the depreciation deduction. To figure the deduction, use the depreciation system in effect when you convert your residential rental property. So we talked about the depreciation in uh, prior presentations or sections or course. And so, so we're going to be using usually, generally that will be the maker's depreciation for any conversion after 1986. Treat the property as placed in service on the conversion date. So example. Let's take a look at an example. Your converted residence, see the previous example under, under figure the basis earlier, was available for rent August 1st. So same example. Using table 2-2D, see chapter 2, the percentage for year 1 beginning in August is 1.364% and the depreciation deduction for the year 1 is 2005, which is that 147,000 basis we came out to times that percent. So in other words, we alloc we assign the property according to the tax code, what type of property it is, such as like residential rental property. Then we apply the proper tables, which are applying the proper depreciation calculations, which for uh, rental, which for rent 27.5 years, I believe, is going to be the the life of the property, and, and it's going to be straight line depreciation mid month uh, convention uh, typically that we're going to use in order to calculate it. Clearly, tax software helps us with those calculations.